Book Four, Chapter Forty One of Amadis of Gaul. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Amadis of Gaul by Vasco de Lobera. Translated by Robert Southey. Book Four, Chapter Forty One. Of what happened to Don Bruno of Bonamar and Angriotta of Estravaus and Branfil in the succour which they brought to the Queen of Dacia. So joyful was the Queen of Dacia for the aid which she had obtained that it was some time before she asked the knights who they were. Good lady, quoth Angriotta, so little will you know us that the knowledge of our names will neither lessen nor increase your hope of help from us. These two knights are brethren, the one is Don Bruneo of Bonamar, the other Branfil. Don Bruneo, by his spouse, is brother to that Amadis of Gaul whom you were seeking. My own name is Angriotte of Estravaus. When the queen heard that, she exclaimed, O oh, good sirs, now do I thank God that I found you, for your renown is everywhere gone abroad. They who told me of the great wars between Amadis and King Lisuarte told us also of the best knights who were there engaged, and I well remember your names among the best. Thus they continued their voyage till they reached the kingdom, and then it was resolved that the queen should remain on shipboard till she saw what success they had, and they, taking their horses and arms and their squires and two knights unarmed who were in the queen's company, to guide them, took their way toward the city wherein the princes were besieged, which was a good day's journey from the shore, and they bade their squires carry with them food and barley for the horses, that they might not enter any inhabited place. They rode on till evening, and then rested a while upon the skirts of a forest, and gave their horses to eat, then mounted again and continued their way, till about an hour before daybreak they arrived at the camp. As covertly as they could, they reconnoitred it to see where was the weakest part, that they might break through, and having done that, they bade their squires and the two knights to use their endeavour, while they were fighting, to reach the town. Accordingly, they three charged upon ten knights, whom they found before them. At the first encounter each overthrew his man, and they broke their lances, and then laid about them so manfully with their swords that the other knights, thinking they were attacked by a greater number, began to fly, crying out for help. Now, quoth Angriotta, let us leave them and get to the walls. This they did. The uproar had brought some of the besieged to the ramparts, who knew the two knights, and without delay opened the portal and admitted them. The princess, hearing the outcry, hastily arose, and when they heard that these knights were come to their help, and that the queen, their mother, was living, of whom before they had heard no tidings, whether she were alive or dead, they were greatly rejoiced, and the townspeople also took heart. So the knights were lodged in the palace, and disarmed, and then went to rest. Meantime there was a great uproar in the duke's camp, the whole army were alarmed, and it was day before the tumult subsided. The duke questioned the knights, and they said they had seen about eight or ten horsemen, though they believed there had been more, and that they had entered the town. Upon this he said, They must be some of the country, and I will inquire who they are, and if I can learn they shall lose their lands. He then bade the army disarm, and retire to their quarters. After Angriotte and his companions had slept a while, they rose and heard mass with the young princes and then required them to summon all their people, that they might see what was their force. When this was done, they said it was enough to resist the numbers of the duke, and they three took counsel together, and resolved that when it was night an attack should be made upon the besiegers, and Don Bruneo, at the same time, attempt to escape on another side with the youngest prince, and go to certain places in that district which were well affected, but had been compelled to supply the duke's camp, because they saw their king slain, and that the queen was fled, and the princes besieged. Among them, it was thought, Don Bruneo might collect some succours, when they were encouraged by his presence, and the sight of the prince, the which, if he could do, he should make certain signals, and they would sally by night, while he at the same time attacked the camp. When the night was far advanced, Angriotte and Branfil, and all the people of the town, sallied out, and Don Bruneo and the prince went out on the other side, as had been agreed. Angriotte and Branfil, led the way along a lane between gardens which they had noted by day, and which led into the plain where the army was encamped. This plain was not guarded by day, but by night about twenty men were set to watch it, 
these they charged so hotly that they soon overthrew them killing some and beating down the rest angriotte and branfil passed on felling all those who came from the camp at the uproar and thus they continued their way till they came out into the open plain the duke was now on horseback and being enraged to see such confusion excited by so few enemies he spurred at them and his people followed so furiously that it seemed as if the ground would split so that the townsmen were dismayed and fell back into the lane and none remained in the field except angriotte and branfel who bore the brunt of all that multitude and they though they bestirred themselves well and slew many and even beat the duke from his horse were perforce obliged to retreat into the lane also where they halted for the place was narrow the duke though he had fallen was not wounded he was soon remounted and when he saw the enemies making good their ground and that those two knights resisted all his power and maintained the pass he cried out shame upon his knights that they let two men baffle them with that so many advanced with him and made such an attack that angriotte and his comrades and their people were driven up the lane some way and the duke thought he had won the battle and that he might enter the town with them so advancing like a conqueror before his men sword in hand he came up to angriotte and smote him on the helmet for which he received payment without delay for angriotte after he had seen how this man took the command always had had his eye upon him and now that he was in his reach lifted up his sword and dealt him such a blow upon the helmet as took away all his strength and brought him to the ground at the horse's feet then he shouted to his people to take him for it was the duke he and branfil immediately advanced and beat back the enemy for as the lane was narrow they fought to advantage as they could only be attacked in front meanwhile the duke was taken he as he recovered knew not in whose hands he was but his men thought that he was slain and retreated into the field then the two knights forbore to pursue being satisfied with the advantage which they had gained and retired into the town their horses soon died of their wounds and their arms were in bad plight but they themselves had no great hurt at the gate they found prince garinto for so he was called and you may imagine the pleasure he felt to see them safe and the duke a prisoner of all this don bruneo knew nothing save only that he heard the uproar there were only a few men on foot left on the side where he went out for the rest were gone toward the place of battle these men were without any to lead them and he would not endanger the prince by attacking them but passed through them without hindrance and thus they rode on all the remainder of the night following their guide when it was morning they came in sight of a good town called alimenta from whence they saw two armed knights coming towards them and the guides told him they belonged to the duke's party these were they whom the duke had sent to all the places round to learn who had succoured the town and to order more food for the camp look you to the child cried don bruneo i will see what kind of knights they can be who follow so wicked a lord then he made towards them who thought he was one of the camp crying out defend yourselves ye bad knights who live with the traitor for i defy you to death at this they replied you shall have the reward of your folly we should have let you pass taking you for a friend with that they ran at him all three break their spears but he whom don bruneo encountered was driven to the ground so violently that he could neither move hand nor foot sword in hand don bruneo then turned against the other and a brave battle ensued but that other knight was not of such force as was don bruneo nor so practised in such dangers and the blows fell on him so heavy that he dropped his sword and lost both his stirrups and fell upon the neck of his horse crying for god's sake do not kill me yield then quoth bruneo i yield he replied to save my life and my soul alight then this he did but he tottered and fell don bruneo made him rise go see if thy companion be alive or dead and he went and unlaced his helmet and when the other knight felt the air it somewhat revived him don bruneo then beckoned with his sword to the young prince for the guide had gone some way forward with him distrusting the event of the combat when the child came up and saw what don bruneo had done he was greatly amazed good child said he order your enemies to be slain though this would be but poor vengeance for the treason which their lord committed against your father the child replied but peradventure sir knight these had no part in that treason and if it please you we had better take them alive than slay them this answer pleased don bruneo 
and he thought that if the child lived he would be a good man. He then bade the guide lay the one knight who was stunned across his horse, and making the other mount, they all proceeded to the town. Greatly did the townsmen wonder to see those knights who had left them that morning return in such a plight, and in this array were they carried along the street into the square, where the people soon collected, who, when they saw the prince, they kissed his hand and wept, saying, Sir, if we dared put in execution what our hearts desire, or if we saw any hope, we should be ready to die in your service. But we know of no remedy, for we have no chief or leader. O oh, men of little heart, quoth Don Bruneo, do you not remember that you are vassals of the king, this child's father, and now also of the king his brother? How do you now discharge the duty to which you are bound, seeing your lord slain by so great treason, and his children besieged by the wicked duke his enemy? Sir Knight, replied one of the most honourable of the townsmen, you say truth, but we have had none to lead us on, and we are people who live more by our substance than by arms. But now that our prince is here, and you to protect him, say what we are able and ought to do, and to the best of our power we will do it. You speak like a good man, said Don Bruneo, and it is reasonable that the king should well reward you, and all who will follow your opinion. I am come to lead you, and to die or live with you. And then he told them he was of the firm island, and in what manner he had come with the queen. At this there was a great acclamation, and the people cried, There never a knight of the firm island who was fortunate since the famous Amadis of Gaul won it. Order us as you think good, and we will obey. Don Bruneo then thanked them for their good will, and made the young prince thank them also. He then had the gates made fast, and said to them, Go ye to your houses, and eat, and make ready your arms. I and the prince will go to the next town, and return hither with such force as we can raise there, and then I will lead you in such manner that if the enemy await us they shall be all destroyed. They have already enough to do, now such help is come to the king." As they were preparing to depart at noon, two countrymen came to the gate in great haste, and bade the guards let them in, for they brought good tidings. So they were led before the prince and Don Bruneo, to whom they related how the duke had been taken, and that his army were breaking up in confusion. We, said they, are of a neighbouring valley, and have been to the camp with provisions, and seeing this we came here, that the townsmen might be on their guard, lest these men should attempt to spoil them in their retreat. Upon this Don Bruneo summoned all the people to the great square, and he and the prince rode among them, and made these countrymen repeat their tidings. Now, good friends, said he, I will go no farther for succour, for we are enough, and great shame would it be if we should have no part of this glory. And the townsmen all cried, As soon as it is dark, let us set forth. He would fain have persuaded the young prince to remain there in safety, but he would not forsake Don Bruneo. So as soon as it was night, they set out towards the camp, and when they had advanced some way, made the appointed signal. The townsmen, seeing it, knew that Don Bruneo had sped well, and they prepared to sally. But the besiegers, seeing their fires kindled by night, and having lost their duke, were in great alarm, and as fast as they could, broke up their camp, and retired while it was yet dark, so that they had gone some way before their retreat was discovered. And when Don Bruneo came up to the camp, and they of the town on the other side, they found it deserted. Howbeit they pursued them, and coming up to them at daybreak, made great slaughter, and took many prisoners, and returned with much spoil and great glory to the town. They then sent for the queen. Who can tell the joy she felt when she came and saw her son safe, and her enemy a prisoner? Angriotte and his companions then besought her leave to depart, that they might return to the firm island, but she entreated them to remain two days, that her son might be made king, and justice done upon that traitorous duke in their presence. They replied that they would willingly see the king crowned, but not the punishment of the duke. He was in her power, and she might deal with him as she thought fit after their departure. The queen then had a great scaffold erected in the square, covered with rich cloth of silk and gold, and there the chiefs of the realm were assembled, and the prince Garinto and the three knights, and they brought the duke, in such evil plight as he was, upon a horse without a saddle. And the trumpet sounded, and the prince was proclaimed King of Dacia, and Angriotte and Don Bruneo placed upon his head a crown of gold, set with pearls and precious stones. 
then were there great sports and rejoicings made for the rest of the day, to the great shame and sorrow of the duke, whom all the people reviled. But those knights besought the queen to send the duke away, or else they would depart, for they would not see such insults offered to any prisoner in their presence. Upon this the queen remanded him to prison, seeing that it displeased the knights. She now besought them to accept certain rich jewels, but they said they would take no reward for what they had done, only as they had heard that the greyhounds and spaniels of that land were excellently good, if it pleased her they would take some for their sports in the firm island. More than forty were then brought them, and they chose such as they liked best. When the queen saw that they would depart, she said to them, My good friends, since you would not take my jewels, you must needs take one which I value above all others in the world, and that is, the king my son, whom you shall present in my name to Amadis, that in his company he may be instructed in all good things that beseem a knight, as God hath already abundantly provided him with temporal goods, and tell him that if my son should live to years sufficient, he shall receive knighthood more honourably from his hand than from any other living and that for his own sake, and for yours, who have recovered me my kingdom, it is at his and your disposal. For this honour they thanked the queen as she deserved, and without delay embarked, the queen going with them to the shore, and on her return she had the duke hanged, that all might behold what fruit the flowers of treason produce. They sailed on till they reached the firm island, and then sent to tell Amadis that the young king of Dacia was in their company. Amadis and Agrayes went out to meet him, and they courteously bade him welcome, and lodged him with Don Bruneo, till he should have companions suitable to his age. End of chapter 41 of Book 4